A new education bill hits the Arizona State House. It requires students to learn about people who fled communism. Beijing mandates a growing list of detailed security measures. That's in preparation for the Chinese Communist Party's 100th anniversary. Despite the strict regulations, one man managed to set a fire right in front of China's foreign ministry in Beijing. Taiwan's foreign minister outlines the potential for military conflict with Beijing. Two Asia experts give their takes, while a Japanese politician also chimes in. Is Hong Kong's freedom dying? Some say it's alive and well. Activists say they're regrouping behind an invisible front line, one that's harder to invade with tear gas and rubber bullets. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A new education bill is passing the Arizona State House. It requires students to learn about people who fled communism. A state lawmaker who fled communism himself explains why it's important. It was the fall of Saigon in 1975, and 12 year old Quan Nguyen boarded a U.S. Air Force cargo jet with nothing but a small bag of clothing. 46 years later, he is now a member of the Arizona House. When the House debated a bill that would mandate schools to teach the tragedy of communism, one of Nguyen's Democratic colleagues claimed that white nationalism is a greater threat than communism. So let me tell you something about white nationalism. White nationalism didn't drown 250,000 Vietnamese in the South China Sea. The communists did. White nationalism did not execute 86,000 South Vietnamese at the fall of Saigon. Communists did. White nationalism did not put me here. Communism did. The education bill passed the State House last Friday. It requires public schools to teach how communism and totalitarianism conflict with American principles. And teachers have to share stories of people who fled communism. The state has to come up with new K-12 civic education standards. They have to center around the original intent of the country's founding documents and teach Americans the responsibility of defending and preserving liberty. I lost most of my cousins, my family members due to communism. If we don't stand up to teach communism to our children, we'll lose this country. So, sir, don't mock me. Republican lawmaker Judy Burgess says the new civic standards will prepare students to be civically responsible and knowledgeable adults. And another Republican lawmaker, Jake Hoffman, says the reality is that one of the greatest threats facing the globe today is communism and totalitarianism. The Arizona Senate will soon be looking at the bill. The Chinese regime is welding every manhole cover in Tiananmen Square shut. That's to prepare for its 100th anniversary celebrations. U.S. broadcaster Voice of America says Beijing has entered an unprecedented state of tightened security control. Reuters says the Chinese regime secretively held a final rehearsal on Friday, ahead of the ceremonies to be held at Beijing's Bird Nest Stadium. CCP slogans blanket the streets, along with armed police officers and surveillance cameras. Roads to Tiananmen Square are blocked, with packs of police cars watching at every intersection. Residents nearby told Reuters that people living in Beijing's central Dongqing district are undergoing a detailed household registration inspection. Police go from door to door, confirming who lives there. And police say this is just normal inspections. Residents living in the so-called key sections are required to follow special rules. For 24 hours on the CCP's anniversary, they have to close all adjacent windows and draw all curtains. There's no peeking and no photos and no guests allowed and no charging for their electric vehicles. A man set fire right in front of the Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing on Monday. An online video captured the event. It happened just two days before the CCP's 100th anniversary on July 1st. In the video, the man first set fire on the right side of the entrance. Wow. While security guards put out the fire with an extinguisher, the man went to set the left side on fire again and accidentally ignited his pants. Security guards eventually put out the fire and took the man from the scene. He appeared to be shouting, but it was inaudible in the video. There have been no official reports of the incident. The CCP will celebrate its 100th anniversary this week, but authorities still seem uneasy. 
It's been a year since Beijing imposed a sweeping national security law on Hong Kong. It aims to crack down on pro-democracy protests. But pockets of activism still exist in the city today. People are regrouping behind an invisible front line that is harder to disrupt with tear gas and rubber bullets. Eve Johnson reports. In a bustling shopping district in Hong Kong, Herbert Chow is walking a fine line, selling memories of the pro-democracy demonstrations that swept the city in 2019. Chow runs a chain of children's clothing stores called Chicky Duck. But this particular shop, with its protest-themed T-shirts, stickers and pins, could cross the line into crime under the city's national security law. It was handed down by Beijing a year ago and could mean up to life in prison for what mainland China deems subversion, successionism, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. Chow's shop has already been raided by police, but he says he isn't budging. I obey the law. I haven't violated the law. The red line of the national security law is always moving. If selling these products is considered inciting the public, if they dare to sink so low, I will fight to the end. Chow says he still hopes for a democratic future, and he isn't alone. Independent journalist Jade Chung focuses her reporting on the city's most vulnerable. She says that over the past year, self-censorship has crept in, making interviewees and reporters more careful about what they say. But she also says she has no plans to stop. I still hope to stay and make the city my ideal place. At least I can uphold values. I don't want the new practices to replace them. Critics say the national security law is being used to chip away at freedoms and stifle dissent. Authorities have made certain songs and slogans illegal. The public broadcaster has removed protest-related archives, and democracy books have been pulled from the shelves of public libraries. Like the shop owner and the journalist, filmmaker Kiwi Chow has his eye to the future, working on a documentary of the protests, he says, to preserve the memory. If I really get arrested, I will find comfort in the fact that I'm being punished for carrying out justice. And so I am at peace. I have already passed the challenge of fear. Hong Kong this week also marks the 24th anniversary of the handover from British to Chinese rule. Activist groups have applied for permission to hold a rally, but police have refused. A senior journalist with Hong Kong-based pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily was released from police custody on Tuesday. That's two days after he was arrested at the airport. He had been trying to leave Hong Kong and head for the UK. Feng Wai Kong was the seventh Apple Daily employee to get arrested. 500 police officers raided the media outlet about two weeks ago, arresting five executives in the process. The outlet was later forced to shut down. Local media reports say Feng was released on cash bail of more than 25,000 U.S. dollars. Authorities also confiscated his travel documents. Coming up, Taiwan's foreign minister outlines the potential of military conflicts with Beijing. Two military experts on Asia have their own take on the hot topic. And a Japanese politician is also chiming in. More on that after the break. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. Taiwan's foreign minister outlines the potential for a military conflict with Taiwan. We spoke with two Asian military experts to get their take on the hot topic. Taiwan needs to prepare for a military conflict. That's what Taiwanese Foreign Minister Joseph Wu told to CNN when talking about Beijing's escalating military threats. Communist China has never ruled Taiwan but has long proclaimed it as its own territory and has vowed to take it over by force. Just a week ago, CCP leader Xi Jinping affirmed his ambitions. His regime sent out the largest military jet incursion into Taiwan's airspace in history. Senior fellow on Asian military affairs at the International Assessment and Strategy Center Richard Fisher has written a book on China's military modernization in 2008. He says Beijing's pursuit of hegemony will only become more intense. 
the broad, vast array of uh, preparations by the Chinese Communist Party to achieve uh, global hegemony are uh, a sight to behold. And uh, the uh, uh, conquest of Taiwan is merely the first step, I mean, a major step, but the first step in, in a long road to the final uh, goal of global hegemony. In the CNN interview, the Taiwanese minister also said that Taiwan has a geopolitical importance in the South China Sea and beyond. There are concerns that China could threaten the U.S. by breaking the first island chain. Beijing sees the chain as a blockade against its military expansion. The chain consists of a group of islands including Taiwan, Japan's Okinawa and the Philippines. Independent international security analyst Richard Bitzinger weighs in on the situation. He says the U.S. always stands with Taiwan. But some U.S. allies may not explicitly commit to defending Taiwan in the case of a conflict with Beijing. They have increasing concerns over what Bitzinger calls China's extremely bad behaviors in the South China Sea. But he also explains there is at least one strong signal coming out explicitly. What you're trying to do is create international uh, collaborative mechanisms uh, that would deter China. He says if the shooting match starts, we don't know where it will end. So the wise thing to do is to stop the situation from getting worse. One of the ways they're trying to do that is by standing up early and forcefully and trying to send out strategic markers that Taiwan uh, is an off-limits uh, issue. That is, we're not going to allow any kind of change uh, unilater unilaterally on the part of the Chinese uh, with into cross-strait relations. Is Xi going to be the one taking over Taiwan militarily? Betzinger says it's unlikely, unless Xi has extremely high confidence. That's because doing so would risk the entire Chinese communist regime. But Fisher seems to see a Chinese invasion as something more likely, even though Xi may have to accept the massive casualties. PLA has proven historically that it is willing to sacrifice an enormous amount of, of the lives of Chinese soldiers in order to achieve objectives. As tensions continue in the Taiwan Strait, the world will continue to pay attention to the region. Japan is sending out a warning against threats from Beijing. Japan's deputy defense minister said Monday it is necessary to wake up to Beijing's pressure on Taiwan and protect the island as a democratic country. In an online speech to U.S.-based think tank the Hudson Institute, Nakayama explained democratic countries must protect each other. Many countries, including the U.S. and Japan, have been following a one-China policy for decades. The strategy recognizes mainland China, but not Taiwan. The communist regime considers itself the only legal representative of China and claims Taiwan as part of its territory. That's despite the island's separate constitution and democratic government. But Nakayama questioned whether the decision to follow a one-China policy would stand the test of time. He also highlighted growing threats posed by China in sectors like space, missile technology, cyber and nuclear, adding that we have to wake up. In response, Beijing called Nakayama's words highly sinister, dangerous and irresponsible and urged the Japanese government to clarify its statement and ensure this wouldn't happen again. The U.S. and Taiwan will hold trade talks this week. They resumed the trade and investment talks that started during the Obama administration. The negotiations are to start on Wednesday and are the first talks in five years between the two countries. High on the topic list are supply chain security and digital trade. Taiwan is a member of the World Trade Organization, but fears over Beijing's reaction have discouraged countries from dealing with the island. So far, Taiwan only has free trade deals with Singapore and New Zealand. Beijing has long been blocking Taiwan from representing itself on the international stage. Why does Taiwan refuse to be taken over by Beijing? Political factors may be only one side of the coin. The other side could be economic factors. To understand why, we only need to compare their per capita GDP. Taiwan's GDP per capita is higher than even the richest city in China. After Beijing announced the census data earlier this year, some Chinese experts analyzed it and found something that surprised them. 
That is, Taiwan's per capita income beats that of every Chinese city, even one of China's richest cities, Beijing. According to official Chinese data, in 2020, the average annual income in Beijing is over $25,000, while in Taiwan, that figure is over $28,000. That's also higher than the figure in Shanghai, which is over $24,000. The gap is even bigger when comparing Taiwan's per capita GDP to that of China as a whole. Taiwanese citizens earn an average 2.5 times more than Chinese citizens. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said a year ago that China has over 600 million people with a monthly income of merely $140. Tesla's image took another dent in China today, as the company recalls nearly 300,000 vehicles. China's safety regulator says drivers can accidentally switch cruise control on or off during sharp turns. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the story. Tesla is recalling more than 285,000 vehicles in China. China's Vehicle Safety Authority said Tesla was implementing the voluntary recall. Nearly 90 percent of the vehicles were made in China, the rest were made in the U.S. The State Administration for Market Regulation alleges there is a flaw in the Tesla system. It means that drivers could mistakenly switch on or off an active cruise control feature. This could lead to hazardous situations. The fault was identified in its Model 3 and Model Y vehicles. Owners will not need to take their vehicles in to get them fixed. A software update will sort the issue. Tesla has enjoyed a luxury status in the world's biggest electric vehicle and car market. To some extent, that brand image has been tarnished by a string of high-profile crashes, price changes and recalls. Tesla's share price seemed unaffected by the news Monday. They were up over 2% during the day. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. The CCP could potentially monitor more than a billion people's financial data. That's because Jack Ma's fintech giant Ant Group is preparing to start a credit scoring company with Chinese state-owned enterprises. The two sides are currently talking, and they are likely to form a joint venture. And that would grant Chinese regulators access to the Ant Group's massive data trove. Ant Group owns Chinese online payment platform Alipay. More than a billion people in the world use the app to spend, borrow or invest their money. The data has been key to Ant's success. Chinese regulators are trying to have the state-owned shareholders play a bigger role in the new firm. They are also talking about what data the new firm would collect. The new firm could be established as soon as the third quarter of this year. Earlier this month, Chinese regulators approved Ant Group's plan to set up a consumer finance company. Ant will hold half of the shares. TikTok insiders reportedly told CNBC the popular social media app is tightly controlled by its Chinese parent company. And that includes access to its U.S. users' data. Some cybersecurity experts say this could effectively end up feeding the Chinese regime, whose current approach to intelligence includes the collection of vast amounts of data. A recruiter, along with four other former employees, told CNBC they're concerned that TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, has access to American user data and is closely involved in TikTok's product development and decision-making. They told the outlet there are almost no boundaries between the two companies. Cybersecurity expert James Lewis says he is not surprised by the report. He says there is no respect for the rule of law or human rights in China. Because TikTok is so popular, popular has immense amounts of data on its users, and there's a concern that that data could be shared with the Chinese government for intelligence or surveillance purposes. TikTok is a popular social app based in Los Angeles. It was launched internationally in 2017 by ByteDance. Now it has 100 million monthly users in the U.S., most of them teens and young adults. TikTok's former employees told CNBC when an American employee tried to get a list of global TikTok users, including Americans, with some specific features, they had to reach out to a data team in China for access. The China team could pull up all the information TikTok had about those users. With their specific IDs, the sources said this is common practice at TikTok. Five or six years ago, China developed a new approach to intelligence that basically used uh, big data, massive data collection and data analytics. 
Lewis says over the last few years, the Chinese regime has been trying to acquire huge amount of data on foreign citizens, including Americans, and that TikTok is an ideal platform for this purpose. TikTok could get some really useful data if you think about facial recognition technology.、Um, TikTok provides millions of faces for China to collect and analyze. That's just one example, but it's this growth in Chinese data analytics as a source of intelligence that is at the root of the concern. Another concern Lewis raises is that the Chinese regime can use TikTok as a platform for its own propaganda, such as the Chinese campaign claiming the coronavirus came from an American military laboratory. The Trump administration tried to ban TikTok in the U.S., but a federal court stopped his executive order. Earlier this month, President Biden revoked Trump's executive orders, instead asking the Department of Commerce to set criteria for the government to evaluate the risk of apps connected to foreign adversaries. Lewis says that could create a legal framework so the courts can't refuse a TikTok ban. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, be sure to check out our latest special report on Epoch TV. Wall Street's love affair with the Chinese regime is no secret, but it's becoming more of a concern. So our priority is not to get access for Goldman Sachs in China. Our priority is to make sure that we are dealing with China's trade abuses that are harming American jobs. As Beijing's autocratic regime furthers its goals to replace the U.S. as the world's leader, it begs the question: Do we really want big banks to get even more involved with the Chinese regime? It could end with them funneling more American investors' money, your money, into communist China, all while boosting their economy, funding their military, and facilitating their human rights abuses. That's on top of the fact that some of These are passive investments that most Americans don't even know about. In this special report, we explore how exactly Wall Street funnels money into China, what the magnitude of the wealth transfer is, and the regime's unsettling ultimate purpose for buddying up with Wall Street. To find out, check out our latest special report on Epoch TV or NTD's cable TV. China in Focus is partnering with the platform where you can watch our exclusive content every Friday night. In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current-day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website, and the Epoch TV website. Thanks for watching, and see you tomorrow.